Auckland International Airport, 9 a.m. November 13. A yellow Boeing 707 freighter lumbers to a parking space on the tarmac. About the same time the plane lands, in a stadium not 10 miles from the airport, men race the clock to build a giant outdoor stage. The yellow plane's been chartered for five weeks by English rock band Deep Purple, cost a quarter of a million dollars. Twenty tons of sound gear came on the plane, including an electronics expert and 20 roadies. All these men employed by the band. Among them, a top road manager whose nickname is Magnus. What's the biggest hassle in a, in a thing this size, you know? Uh, that's really hard to say. Could be anything, you know, from, from trucks breaking down to the stage not being big enough, you know. But we send out a rider which specifies the size of the stage needed. And uh, usually it's pretty together. We can always make compromises ourselves and we never have any real major problems, you know. Do you, you so. set the band gear up yourselves? Well, uh, I, I take care of the drums. No, Stuart I mean, takes the care of the keyboards. We've all got our own jobs, you know. In fact, each person in the band has got his own person, you know. And we've also got an English guy who doesn't actually work for the band. He works for the, the people who own the monitor system and he comes over with the monitors. But as I say, everyone knows everyone else. And that's, it makes things a lot easier that way. You, there's, there's no getting to know everybody each two, you know. It's yeah, because if you've got new guys sometimes, you know, so that personalities could clash anyway, you know. Yeah, they, you know? but we Especially, all get on you know, really well together. And the band is amazing people to work for. How long have you been with them? I've been with them uh, just over two years. But they, they really are amazing. Marvellous blokes Purple may well be, but not to the extent of travelling with 20 tonnes of luggage on a freighter. They travel in style with wives on standard flights, or have personal managers travelling with them. Outside, a fleet of chauffeur-driven limousines awaits. One each, cost $500. interviews at the airport. The band's tired after its flight from Hawaii, so it's straight to the hotel for a few hours sleep.
Oh, that's an extremely rude looking object you're holding in front of me. <laughs> what can we do on your choice? How's that blue? That's really not blue. Yeah, it's we made that up on the way here. It's really conservative. Deep Purple's had quite a few changes. Today's lineup from the left Ian Pace, Tommy Bolin, Glenn Hughes, and David Coverdale. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's certainly a whack of gold discs you got anyway. A lot of humour there. Where are you used to getting them? Uh, well, yeah, you can get very blasé about getting them, but it's always nice. I think we've only ever had one presentation of albums which has been bigger than this, and we sort of rigged that up in England because there were a load of American albums we hadn't got, and English albums, so we had about 40 or 50 albums there all together. But it was a bit of a publicity hype, but we thought we beat McCartney to the punch. Yeah. You've had quite a quite a few changes in the band. How how does this in fact affect you? <laughs> it creates a lot of hard work. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to get people attuned to different members all the time, and it takes a little while for the new bands to wear themselves in. We've been really lucky with with this um, set of five people in that it's come together in a matter of a few months, as opposed to like nearly a year for the old bands. Uh, so we're all very happy and very confident and very proud of the album we've done. When, when Richie Blackmore left, was it a shock or had you known it was coming? Well, we knew it was coming, but it was a shock when he told us. It was like mid-tour, you know. Um, and we'd planned uh, another album at the end of that tour, which was in Europe. And everybody was all like getting into the whole thing and getting quite excited about the way things were going. Then, bang, out of, out of nowhere it came, uh, I'm off. <laughs> And uh, there was a great deal of gloom and despondency for about a week, and then because uh, everybody, everybody decided to quit, that was it. You know, we can't take any more changes. Then uh, a wonderful little man we have working for us called Bill Reed, who's officially our accountant, but more like a father figure to us all, said, "Well, why have you got to stop? Why don't you go on?" And he just planted the seed that maybe there was another chance, and we took it. Any, any bad vibes between you and Richie Blackmore? No, no. We, Richie's a weird dude. He, he says loads of weird things in the press, which he always denies afterwards, which 90% of the time I believe him because he, he's probably the most misquoted man in the world, you know. I, I know he was bored with what he was doing for the last year with us, and he's not the most subtle of people when it comes to talking. So some of the things he tends to say look a bit outrageous if you don't know him too well. But, oh yeah, we're still great pals. You did quite well with your new vocalist too, quite lucky there. Yeah, it wasn't bad, was it? Yeah. Um, what we did for, for the vocal things, we'd seen Glenn live, but obviously at that point David did, was just a, a piece of tape to us. He just sent a little tape in and we listened to it amidst quite a few others. And quite honestly, he was the only one that had the vaguest sort of knowledge about what he was doing. They would, and they, that was only four bars. He sent a, about a 15-minute tape in, about 30 seconds of it were good. The rest was rubbish. But you could tell from that 30 seconds, a little bit of work, it was there. And here he is. You know? David, you took over from one of the sort of top vocal spots in the country, in the world almost, with Deep Purple. Just how difficult was it for you? Uh, it wasn't too bad, really, because the members of the band I was working, you know, were real great human beings. They didn't make me feel as if I was replacing anybody. It made me feel it was just ah, oh, sorry, it made me feel just like a, a member immediately, you know. Did you get a shock when you actually got the job? Yeah, right, yeah absolutely. Uh, I'd re I'd sort of felt I could do something, but I didn't expect to get such an exalted position, if you know what I mean. But uh, fortunately, it's, everyone seems happy with it. What what were the big changes then in your life? You know, what money? Uh, well, I don't like to think about it, the money side of it. You know, I hear so, such gross amounts of money mentioned, you know. I couldn't concentrate on being creative as far as a musician's concerned if I took all that seriously. But uh, it affected a lot of my privacy. I've just been talking about like, my social ability. If I'm introduced as the commodity of which I'm involved in, conversation's over. That's it, you know. Like people who, are, who don't know the business move away, and people who know the business come in, you know what I mean? So it's a bit strange. But I, I wouldn't change it, I love it. Really. Must have been quite a shock when Richie Blackmore left the band. Not really. I was really close to Richie, I knew him, I wrote a lot of the music with him. Uh, I expected it. But I'm, what, what, what I am surprised at was his... Uh, 
his album, you know, which was no different from early purple. You know, I expected, I don't know whether you heard Jeff Beck's album, the thing called Blow by Blow, you know, which is a guitar album. I thought I expected Richie to come out with something like that, but it, it sounds just like purple, but the musicians I don't find as, as exciting as, you know, this is removed. I love the vocalist. I live near, next door, more or less, and little Ronnie and me get on really well. Um, but I was surprised at his choice of material, etc. You know, but he'll do great. He'll do phenomenally well. Just one final thing. I haven't asked you any questions about drugs, groupies, hypodermic needles. So what have you got to say about that? Uh, love it all. <laughs> love it all. How's an American shaking up, shaping up into what's basically, you know, an English sort of band? It's. Uh, I didn't think. It, uh, to be honest, at first, I didn't think it would. It would be. It would work. I, I really didn't. But um, we had a jam, and like um, within the first uh, minute or two, you know, I could tell that they were into the same things I was into, which was very uh, kind of R and B, kind of uh, funk, kind of uh, you know. And and they, I think they were hunting for a, a sort of. Uh, Freedom, which which I don't think, uh, like for instance, Richie gave them, you know. So like they were so open to the whole thing. It was it was it turned out lovely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be. You know. um, six months before I joined, I was starving. <laughs> Dan moves to individual caravans backstage. John Lord okays an interview, though he's going to be disturbed halfway through it when his personal manager calls him to finish the interview and to go on stage. How did a you know a classically trained musician get into rock music in the first place? Uh, well, I was at drama school and uh, I had no money and no. Um, Source, other source of income at all, and a friend of mine asked me to play in a, a blues band with him. It was the early 60s, beginning of the blues boom in England, R&B, we used to call it. And um, I really just started doing about two or three nights a week just to pay for the flat I was living in. And uh, it escalated from there. You know. I liked it, I enjoyed myself. Formed a proper band with this guy, and uh, that was the band that became the Artwoods, which really sort of where I started in the business. Yeah, most people would, you know, know of the Art Woods, and when you think back to those particular days and compare it with what you're doing today, you know, the mechanics of the whole business today are quite frightening. Uh -huh. Well, you've seen that lot out there. We've yeah. Just about it. yeah but it's necessary, you know. If you like a ticket price, uh, when someone buys a ticket, it's like buying a contract from the group to perform and you know do as best as they can. It's like they're expecting something in return for their money. The mere fact that you multiply it by thousands of people makes no difference. It comes down to the individual in the end. The individual on that side of the, of the stage and the individual on that side of the stage. How much bigger, though, thing, can things get? No, no, no way it can go any further. It, it, I mean, there's a point at which a sponge won't take any more water, and, and that's really where it is with rock and roll. What I'd like to see happening would, would be a few large bands like ourselves and others in our position to at least attempt it's financially very difficult to do. As I've just told you before, we've got 18 people working for us, so it's quite difficult to do what I su I'm going to suggest. But I'd like to see a few bands getting back to doing small gigs. It, just occasionally, you know, to get back to it's a little bit more reality about the whole thing. It's, it gets very unreal, all that number of people to, that you're responsible for. And, but it, it's like a, 
what is that thing, you know, that once it gets going, you can't stop it, you know, it's... it's, it's like a Quatermass experiment. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, something like that. It just keeps going on. But I still enjoy it, you know, I, mean, I, I love the excitement of playing in front of people. To digress just a, a wee bit, do you ever feel that perhaps the music today is becoming a little too intellectual or too esoteric? Uh, on the contrary, I think it could get, you know, I don't see any reason at all why why it shouldn't uh, experiment, you know, I mean... It you don't think it's too in, serious in any way? Maybe in, yeah, in a few places, yeah. But I mean, if people don't experiment, it'll stagnate and stay exactly where it is. I mean, if the Beatles hadn't experimented with certain things, certain parts of the music business as we now know, it just wouldn't exist. And so on, like the Stones, and, you know, you can name many names. Um, I think it's, in, it's vital that the groups experiment. And hopefully not at the audience's expense, but, but um, occasionally it is that way. But it's, I think it's necessary. Talking, you know, of the Stones and people like yourself, um, you're no longer the young generation, you know, the, you're the older generation. Can, can you still identify with, you know, the kids of today? I, well, I hope so, he said, knocking his microphone off. I shall hold and it. Hold quickly, it. Oh, quickly put it on, that's okay. Yeah. I'll hold it. Can I just hold it? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I, don't yeah, I, I, I really hope so, because um, otherwise there's no point in doing what we do. I mean, people come still come to see us, and the people still go to see the Stones and so on. Um, it's it's a difficult question. The the thing we have, uh, okay, we don't have the youth, maybe of say like an eighteen year old, punky rock and roll band, you know, who just starting and really getting outrageous and you know exciting and so on. We don't have their youth. But we, I think we still have the excitement that they can provide, and we have the experience to go with it to provide. You know, perhaps a, a cleaner edge to it, which makes it more. Do you think that there'd be the excitement yeah. today? Of, sorry, do you think there'd be the excitement today to compare with rock when it first started in the fifties? We hear an awful lot about that era. Now that was a one-off, wasn't it? That'll never happen again. I mean, you know, the, the introduction of that kind of music into the way that people were then just can never happen again because times have changed so incredibly violently. You know, I mean. Uh, the, the, the safe, secure, easy, quiet suburban way of life was, was so it's that, and then suddenly people like Chuck Berry and Bill Haley and Little Richard and so on are suddenly screaming down your radio set. That can never happen again, you know. But there's no reason to say, but that's, that's a social thing. But on a musical level, there's no reason to say why it shouldn't happen again. But something incredibly different might not swoop out of nowhere. I don't think there's any reason why that shouldn't happen. Again, just to digress, I, I Someone's was... waving at me from behind the camera. Yeah. Can I just see yeah. if, if it's who I think it is? Yes, it is. Okay. Just, just, just a couple just more seconds me. and we're right with you. Just, just one thing, I was reading in the paper today that um, Roger Taylor, the tennis player, decided to pull out of England because of tax reasons. Now, yeah. I understand that you also live outside of England for tax reasons. Well, we... It's not actually living outside of England, it's kind of an exile. It's like existing outside of England. You know, we actually still are British citizens and we still pay British tax. Um, on a certain level, you know, we haven't actually left the country. It's just a, a way of doing things whereby uh, you try and avoid the, the really heavy, stinging top 30 or 40 percent that they. I mean, we can go up as high as 92 percent of our of our earned income, which is seems to me to be a bit ridiculous. I mean, I know Britain's in trouble and it needs all the help it can get, but uh, I'm also. I mean, an individual who requires certain things, and my working life as a rock musician, as a, a well-paid rock musician, is very small. It's five or six years at the most. John, there are quite a few thousand people out there waiting, so I'll cut it short. Just one final question. Sure. You know, if, if you had your time sort of over again, what do you think you'd like to do? Be a rock musician, I guess. I can't think of anything better to do. Uh, maybe a concert pianist, but. Uh, I think the hard work would put me off before I get eight hours a day. I don't, I, mean, I wouldn't care to practice that. Now I'd be a rock musician. I loved it, every minute of it so far. John, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you.